now, the After Action Review with Rod Rodriguez. And welcome to the After Action Review Podcast. I'm your host, Rod Rodriguez. And in this episode, we're talking to Patrick Fino of Bastion Defense Solutions, LLC, a contra- an overseas contract company. Uh, and I, I got to tell you, I know a lot of you guys out there have uh, a certain idea uh, of what contracting is, overseas contracting. Um, I can tell you that in the last five years, uh, contracting has definitely gone through some serious changes. So before you decide that you're going to go out, you know, go overseas and make that big bank and, and come home and buy your car and buy your house and all this other stuff, do your homework. And part of that homework is honestly listening to this interview with Patrick Fino, who's going to set the record straight on what overseas contracting is, what you can expect, and how you can prepare for how you can pre- prepare yourself uh, to be uh, as marketable as possible as an overseas contractor. But he also talks about you know the difficulties and the challenges that come with starting a business like that. So, without any further ado, Patrick Fino of Bastion Defense Solutions LLC. All right, everyone, I'm here with Patrick Rafino. Patrick. Tell us a little bit about yourself and your business. Well, I'm a 24-year-old former United States Marine. Currently, I recently started a business with two of my friends. We were defense contractors. We have approximately around 120 months OCONUS between Iraq, Afghanistan, and uh, working in Kosovo as defense contractors. So we started a security consulting and security force protection business. We are based out of Evansville, Indiana. Currently, it's been going on strong for about three months. Our main goal is to, one, as everyone should, as any, excuse me, as any veteran-owned business should, employ mm-hmm. as many better, uh, veterans as we can. Nice. Definitely what I like. Um, I think, and yourself included, we're all taking kind of that 10K, uh, 10,000 uh, veterans employment as quick as we can. Um, we're licensed to do force protection, unarmed, static, consulting, surveillance, and or the big thing in today's world is executive protection. So we've been building since that. Uh, I'm currently uh, I'm running as a co-founder, operations, procurement, and marketing, doing as much as I can. Um, we're all vets, as I said, are a belligerent amount of time overseas, so... Mm-hmm. We just, you know, we've been brainstorming. Uh, the co-founder Cody Stump, he came up to me, and we just were talking one day, and you know, he invited me to found, uh, be one of the the founding fathers, essentially, of it, and been doing that since around April, around April, and I love it. I really, I'm really having a good time. And that's it's in awesome. Inf- it's in the infancy stages, and that's the best part. So, so I, I know that, that there's always a certain amount of reluctance to work with government simply because uh, trying to deal with government contracts and uh, it, it seems like this is a very complex uh, bureaucratic system to try and wade through for somebody who's coming out of the military who may not have the familiarity with that. How did you uh, conquer some of those complexities of starting a, a business that has to work so closely tied with the government? Well, I don't think you ever conquer, you know, working for the government. Mm-hmm. You know, the government's always going to make sure they get theirs. But um, I think one of the best things that we did was we kind of divided ourselves into two two factions, you know, mm-hmm. and we want to get these government contracts and we're bidding and stuff like that. But Everyone here in the states needs security. They need the banks need security. Certain uh, energy plants, whatever. Maybe a bar needs once up up security uniform. So mm-hmm. we kind of were like, we've been doing this for a minute. We know how to do. We've done the civilian side of it, but at the same time, you can't put all your eggs in one basket. I believe, and that was the big thing. Is eventually we at first we were like, well, let's kind of build ourselves up. We can subcontract through companies and such like that. But at the same time, we're also building our nest in Evansville, Indiana and starting to gain interest and doing our best to make sure our home base is as strong as it can be. Mm -hmm. So what inspired you to start a security business? I was doing, 
when I got out of the Marine Corps, I was doing kind of low level stuff. Like mm-hmm. I was in school. Um, it kind of stemmed from the point where when I was doing balance from anywhere from balancing to doing uniform uh, work that I was a little bit, uh, you know, lack of fulfillment. I wasn't mm-hmm. anything crazy in the Marine Corps. You know, I did some force protection stuff over in Afghanistan as a, as an augment, but, uh, my main job was a mechanic, but I liked it. You know, mm-hmm. I liked, you meet a lot of great people and stuff, especially being augmented with all these crazy, you know, different people and stuff. So, uh, it was, it was good. And I just kind of felt that, you know, I liked it. I liked the people. We started meeting contacts while I was doing this. Like when I'd work at a bar, someone would say, Hey, do you want to just drive for me this weekend and stuff like that? So we started doing stuff. I found out what government contracting was. Someone, uh, a couple people sent me some links and then it just, it just kept, my interest kept growing in it. And it's always been a need and it's terrible to say, but post nine 11, it's only going up both yeah. in the States and every day we live in a crazy world where no matter what, you know, whether I, it's domestic or foreign. Yeah. yeah. I think there's an interesting point that you just made there. And, and that is, you know, you weren't necessarily immersed in that industry, but you became familiar with it through your experiences in augmentee and then in the civilian sector. So it seems like you're, you became interested in an industry you weren't necessarily immersed in, but your interest kind of kept you in line. And then you became interested in contracting as well. Those two kind of went together. I think that's, that's an interesting lesson because I think a lot of people become interested in something they're not necessarily knee deep in. And that, that right there, they feel like, oh, well, because I'm not in that industry, I can't ever do anything in it. I agree. Um, I've always kind of had this business mind asset, uh, business mind uh, mentality. Um, from when I was a young age, my father's an entrepreneur, but he always taught me to have the safe job and then take the risk. Mm-hmm. My father was a New York State firefighter, and he, but he hustled on the side. Like he did, he started replacing toilet seals, the wax seals, and then eventually started replacing toilets. And then he mm-hmm. did a bathroom, and it kept growing all through his uh, through his stable job. So that's part of the my big philosophy is don't quit your day job yet because if you fall flat on your face, it's going to, you know, then you're done. I just happened to have something that was my day job that really worked out for me that, you know, I met, I met great people, you know, we, we had the same, uh, you know, same type of mentality as far as our worth ethic. And I was always looking to go into business. Like I've always been in the finance. I have, you know, a lot of things I want to do. And, you know, as far as financially and working for myself is definitely one of those goals. And, you know, it was a lot of hard work and a little luck. And I think when you look at all these famous millionaires, venture capitalists, I think they say something similar, you know? Yeah. And that's, a, that's a really good point too. Cause I think there's a, there's a misconception, especially since becoming an entrepreneur is like the new cool thing money will come to you to start your, your business up. And it's like, no man, that this nine to five that you're working, that's your startup money. My, you know? uh, yeah. my father told me like come, living in New York city, I was told if I wanted a decent house, 600,000 to 900,000. And these, and this is just working, you know, a regular job, but mm-hmm. that was a decent house in a decent neighborhood. You, you also being abroad, you know, all the different walks of life how much 600,000 to 900,000 gets you. So when I was 15, I was saving for my house. And then wow. like, yeah, like that was just, I, I thought that was what you were, ha- I had to do, you know, like I, I didn't know what I was going to do. I just knew if I had X amount by X time, I'd be okay to a degree, you know, as long as I kept working hard. So it was always just that hustle mode of save as much money when I w- was in college, the GI bill, I put about 60% towards whatever I made of, on the GI Bill. I'd go out and have fun, but my budget, I'd always budget. So it was constantly a saving, saving, saving. And that was eventually what I used on the investment in the company. And my two other partners, we have the same mentality as well as far as let's create, let's, you know, if, if we fail, because there's always the if, mm-hmm. we're going to be okay because we still didn't quit the day jobs. And we're not at that point where we're climbing up the mountain. And that mountain is when we say, hey, we go full time. And I think too many people kind of go full time too quick. 
which I admire because sometimes you need that push, Mm -hmm. but at the same time, you should have a couple grand to survive, you know, while you get in case you, so. So when you were establishing this bit, when you were, when you were founding this bit, is that the word founding or finding when you were establishing this, this business of yours, (laughs) when you were establishing your business, um, when you had to cut that check and there's a point where everybody has to cut that check to start this thing, to kick this thing off. Uh, how did you feel about that? Was there any reluctance or is any fear involved in that? Well, I think there's always been, I don't want to say fear, but apprehension in everything I've ever really done in life worthwhile. Mm-hmm. You know, when you, when you join the service, right, you, you're scared a little bit, not, maybe not fearful of death, but just like I'm leaving the comforts of whatever life, regardless right. of how good or how bad your life is, whether you're a rich kid or in the, in, you know, in the suburbs or you're a poor kid in the inner city, you're still leaving comfort. And every step of my life has always been kind of apprehension to the next role of getting out of the military. Now I'm used to this, you know, unique mm-hmm. lifestyle. So it was definitely, it was definitely apprehension. I trusted the, I trusted the, uh, Cody. I trusted Cody with a lot. He was a good guy. He was a supervisor where I worked smart, two deployments, Iraq, almost three years here, you know, you know, but uh, I think the biggest thing for me is because I wasn't going to be there for the physical part of mm-hmm. it because I'm still I was still on contract and I'm still I couldn't be there hands on. That was putting the trust in my investment to someone and saying, hey, man, don't screw me over, essentially, you know, and mm-hmm. you can sign all the paperwork you want saying, hey, I'll pay you back type of stuff. But in the end, it's still. Me giving you n- a, a, someone who isn't a loved one or yeah. anyone or a charity <laughs> saying, "Hey, here's X amount of dollars. Hopefully, this works out." And and that's money you, know, you worked hard for. That's money you've been saving. That's yeah. you know that's a part of you that you are putting on the line for for success that you hope will come. And and that's probably why I feel I work, you know, we all work so hard when once you put it because it's, like I said, I still haven't quit my full-time job, but, mm-hmm. you know, I go from working 12 hours to putting another four to six on it, go to the, you know, not sleeping a couple of days in a row, reviewing resumes. I know that it's my, you know, my head's on the line and I'm lucky to the fact that I still have a nest and still have that full-time job, but I don't want to look back and say, man, like I'd be X amount closer to my financial goal if I didn't, you know, because then you play the guessing game and the second, like, man, I should have put in more effort. You know, I slept a little too much. I, you know, I went out that night instead of, you know, reviewing policies or rewriting these policies and stuff. So it's, Mm -hmm. it's definitely something I, uh, you know, I, I'm glad I did. And there's definitely no regret, but there was, there's always apprehension. I think about it all the time, and I think that shows that you care, that it's constantly on your mind. Yeah, and that's, you know, that's a really important uh, uh, note there is there is always going to be some apprehension, but, you know, you're, you're still in your full-time job, and yep. you're working the side hustle bit right now. How do you know when you're ready to jump into full-time? What, what is your expectation on that? I have a set for me. I have a set number I need mm. that in order that for my in my bank account to to for me to go full time, and that if I put everything in, like if I because um I live in Missouri right now. Mm-hmm. I live with my girlfriend in St. Louis. That's where I'm based out of. So it's about a two hour drive. So when I'm leaving here, I'm going back and forth to uh, Missouri. Not every day, obviously, but. Mm-hmm. So that's when I'm ready to kind of fully – when I have X amount of my ba- – I know I'm rambling. I'm sorry. No, you're not X rambling amount of my ba- you're <laughs> In my bank account mm-hmm. where I say, okay, like if we fail, at least I can find another contract real quick and just you know replenish what we lost. And you know everyone's got a mix, mixed opinion about it. Mm-hmm. And the thing is, is people have been successful on both sides. So yeah. I, I know – and I'm very big on it comes down to the individual. So if you're smart and you invest your money right and you do what you need to do and, you know, work as hard as you can, mm-hmm. I think you're going to be successful. You know, maybe with breaks, without breaks, obviously it makes it easier. But 
if you're a turd, all the money in the world, you got a lot of winners who are broke now. So that's absolutely true. So one of the big plans that I hear all the time from veterans getting out of the service or they're on their way out is, man, I'm going to get out and I'm going to be a contractor and I'm going to earn like 300,000 every year. I'm going to do that for five years and retire. I'm I'm, I'm looking because (laughs) I'm not making $300,000 a year. I'm not making six figures. right now. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's, you know, I think a lot of vets are still on that 2005 to 2008, uh, pay scale that was out there for for some contractors um tell us a little bit about the world of contracting now and what vets could expect if they're leaving service to be contractors the first thing i'm going to ask is were they in a tier one sf you know anything you know when you the, the big five i guess uh, green berets uh seals pjs were you a ranger? Okay, yes. Were you a part of the regiment? Okay, you know. Mm-hmm. It's these things called, and you might hear these terms to the audience, PSD, P- PSS. These are the guys you see guarding politicians, diplomats. These are all DOS gigs, Department of State. Now, Department of State, they're not making as much, but they're still doing pretty okay, DOS, from my experience. DOD, they've hit massive pay cuts from all end, ends. Um, where you are the force protection out there every, you know, and that's, and I'm sure you see new people in force protection there. You, you yeah. know very well how it works and, uh, you know, pay cuts, pay raises, pay, you know, pay to the left, pay to the right. For, for me, regardless of money, it's great for the first two years to kind mm-hmm. of like ease your way back into the real world. Because if you just kind of jolt into college, college is a kind of scary place for a veteran. Whether you were kicking in doors mm-hmm. or you were just kind of sitting behind a desk. Because in college, you can't really use curse words as terms of endearment. <laughs> and you go to school and uh, people want to tell you things about the world when you're like, have you ever left X county or X state or X neighborhood city? And they haven't, and they want to tell you things about the world, you know, so. Yeah, so you're, you, you think it's a good transition for somebody who's getting out to do some contract work to kind of ease your way back into, um, I guess, the civilian sector? I agree, but that's just me. You know, yeah. I kind of, I've, I've been out for about three years. And like I said, I didn't, I wasn't a crazy door kicker or nothing like that. You know, I just... I did some gate guard stuff, you know, really nothing crazy. Uh, and even coming back to like the real world, I kind of wish I could have did maybe a, uh, another uh, contract right when I got out, maybe three months. Money, what, I, I'm very frugal. I would have right. saved most of it and uh, did maybe one or two years and then kind of realized like, okay, got my my bearings under me. I have a good nest egg. I don't need the work, of, uh, you know, a low end job. I can go to school, figure out what I want to do. You apply for civil service. If mm-hmm. you want to go into fire, sanitation, whatever, figure out where you need to live. But where I'm at in life right now, I'm pretty happy. You know, I've, I've made a lot of mistakes. I went, I've been arrested, you know, for doing something stupid. I'm very lucky. I didn't have any charges like, filed against me and stuff and convictions all good to go, but mm-hmm. I've done a lot of dumb stuff in my time where I am now to post Marine Corps. So I'm very mm-hmm. lucky that it's worked out for me pretty nicely. And, you know, what uh, you're describing is that is a very typical rough patch right after yeah. you get out. And, you know, that's, that's very common with a lot of veterans. Um, and I think that that's another thing. That's another, um, barrier a self-inflicted, a self-imposed barrier towards success that uh, the veterans have to get over is you're going to get out. You might do some dumb shit. It's very possible. But that doesn't mean that that you're limited or that you should use that to kind of like beat yourself up over. Welcome to the club kind of thing. Like yeah. you're in good company. You can still be successful. Yeah. You can still start your companies. You can still, you know, start your small business and whatnot. Yeah, like – I think 
and I, I went through it after the arrest, especially because I was out of the Marine Corps for like an hour and a half, mm -hmm. to be honest, I, uh, a couple of weeks maybe at the most. And uh, I think there's this this uh, mentality of um, the victimization of like, oh, I was in the Marine Corps and I did this and that. And that's great, man. And I appreciate your service. And, you know, you always, in this conversation is the hard conversation I think vets have. And mm -hmm. um, can I curse on this? I rather Absolutely. Not. You can All say whatever right, the fuck so, you want. Exactly. But what the fuck are you doing now? Well, mm -hmm. I was 82nd, you know, freaking powder division. All right, dude, well, you're 45 years old. You can't see your toes, and you work at freaking Wally World, man. And there's nothing, you know, if that's the life you wanted, that's great. And I'm glad you're achieving your dreams, but I'm 90% sure it's not. Mm -hmm. So I think there was that whole kick in, my, kick in my groin, get the fuck over it move on and be something and after that rest that's when i kind of started you know having a uh you know the gears i started working with a group for veterans i started wanting to give back i did i got into the uh the 22 the 22 awareness and rather than doing push-ups i did it 22 obstacle course races in a year that wow. um yeah it was from zero nine fifteen to zero uh I, I went over my limit a little bit. I think I, I ended in October of 16, raised about, I believe the number was $5,200 or something like that. Went to That's the Military awesome. Resilience Pro Project, a group that helped me. And, uh, you know, I started getting over that victim mentality. And that's when I truly started hitting my stride. I started getting back in shape. I started, you know, realizing like, hey, I'm pretty okay. Like, I have my legs. Because, yeah, I was seeing... Um, the hell is this guy? I, 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 we're going in circles right okay, now. But uh, the gentleman's name was uh, Corporal Todd Love. He was, I don't know if you've ever heard of him. You mm. should definitely look him up. Well, well the, no arm, triple amputee, and this is all he's got. And he's doing these obstacle course races, man. And you got to see this guy. He's doing this thing with Operation Enduring Warrior, and he's just killing it, just crushing it. And I'm like, dude, my legs are good. My arms are good. My, mm. my heart's good. I need to do, start making some plays. And that's kind of where I started going to get out of that, like you said, that whirlwind of I just got out of the military, all that stuff. And that's, this is, you know, this is what I really hope uh, veterans will, will listen to. Uh, there's, and, and I've said it before, and I'm going to say it again. There is more to life than bacon, beer, and boobs. Uh, there is some real, um, there are real issues, there are real problems that, that veterans are facing every day and what you don't need is bravado you need to talk about it we need to address yeah. these issues and i think it's remarkable that you saw the story of this corporal and kind of adopted it to, to say like hey this is a challenge for me i have i'm able-bodied i should be doing more than what i'm doing right now um in that same line of 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 you know doing more than what you're doing now a lot of veterans getting out, looking at contracting, uh, there's this perception that their experience uh, as an infantryman or their experience as uh, a mechanic or whatever um, automatically qualifies them to become contractors in the security field or, or jump right into contracting. Tell me a little bit about some of the, the pitfalls that you've seen in these resumes that you read through. Well, it's it's amazing, man. I'm on a I'm on a DOD contract, and um, it's amazing how many SEALs served in SEAL Team Five and a Half that I work with. Mm -hmm. And um, like I said, I, I want to make it very clear. I'm, I'm I did I wouldn't do much high speed stuff, man. I'm freaking like I said, I did I work gate guard? You know, did very few freaking right. crazy things, and. Even I find the fly, uh, flies, the flaws in the stories of just mm -hmm. like, hey man, like you, like you know, I know, I know you don't do that, and like uh, my experience with that is very limited, and like you know, why are you doing this? And you see it even at work when you see guys like when you see guys shoot, but it's a very diverse background, and um, you know, I don't, and it's uh, you can tell people the cops who was a cop by the way they talk to people because we deal with a lot of local nationals here. So mm -hmm. like, I'm not saying I'm, you know, kissing their ass or very nice to them the whole time. But I, I also, I, I kind of know how to manipulate, you know, and talk to them to the point where, 
you know, I see a couple cops and they're talking to them like it's a traffic stop. Mm-hmm. And you have a decent amount of corrections officers. I've gone into security. Um, right now, DOS is hiring just warehousemen, not even like warehousemen, military, like logistics. Mm-hmm. And they're going for armed logistics men in Department of State jobs where you don't have to be in the military. So when they're going to WHIPS, mm-hmm. you're going to, you know, the WHIPS 2, I believe, which is the is that? non WHIPS 2. Oh, World Protective Services okay. training. Yeah, they'll do it out of Moeoc. Usually, Constellus is is uh, providing that. But um, and this is all stuff you can find online. By the way, I'm not yeah. spewing like uh, I'm not a I'm not that smart. I promise, man. Just Google this stuff, and um, you're having a lot of civilians come in. So it's it's a melting pot. One because I think everyone thinks they're making three hundred thousand dollars, and yeah. it's amazing how when you're in the military, you, you make twenty four thousand dollars a year. And you can scoff at sixty grand, but then go work at, you know, Allied Barden as a freaking bank guard and make twenty seven and feel accomplished. You know, I guess whatever that's them. So it's very diverse. Um, but it sounds like it sounds like one of the issues that you've run into is is fabrication. Like people either exaggerating or fabricating their resumes in order to try and get a job. And, but that's everywhere I find, mm-hmm. you know, not, not contra. I'm sure you, you know, you've been, a, you're abroad, you know, that's my aunt worked in corporate America and it's amazing how many, you know, managers they meet that can't even run yeah. a basic por- uh, payroll, you know? And, I, I think the difference though is if you're fabricating to get a job as a security guy, you might be expected to perform better than you actually can. And that could be, you know, unlike corporate America, if you're not reacting to something properly or you're not really familiar with, with certain uh, types of training. You could hurt somebody. You could kill someone. I mean, I can't tell you how many times I've seen uh, coming through gates where foreign nationals are in charge of security. They're just moving their rifle, just, just flagging everyone. I'm like, really? Like, d- do you, have you ever done this before? Um, and that's always been a concern to me, but as somebody who's run, who's on the uh, other end of this table, saying, "Hey, I'm looking for you know in certain types of employees," you know, how important is it for somebody who is applying to become a contra- a or a security contractor? Um, you know, what are some tips and tricks that you would suggest to somebody to make their resume honest, not just honest, but also appealing? I think your DD is two fourteen. You know, there's plenty of contracts right now, like um, that. You'll start you out. It's a great first step. Um, You know, there's a couple places I know. If you, if you, and this is just out to the audience. If you're not sure if you want a contract, you you maybe you know, you didn't really do much. Maybe never deployed. Come send me an email, and I'll, I'll get you a job somewhere, or I can point you in the right direction if that's what you want to do. But you know, I've. I've had a bunch of people I know that have hit me up and it's not even a money thing. It's when that push comes to shove, when they have mm-hmm. to write that paycheck, it's for some odd reason, people like being home for Christmas, you know, it's crazy to think about, but, uh, yeah, you know, it's, it's, um, it is what it is, you know, yeah. like there are a lot of people, you know, money, money will saturate anywhere, you know, it's, it's hitting all all levels of uh, contracting and um, how far out would you recommend somebody uh, who's getting out of the military? How far out would you suggest that they start putting out those feelers for contract positions? Uh, I can't give a good answer because I waited two and a half years. So I don't want to sit up here and tell you how far Mm -hmm. when I honestly have no idea. Um, Hell man, if you're under a year, I know all the a lot of these companies are going to job fairs and stuff. If you're under a year, I'd, I'd put it in six months, depending on if you've had a clearance or not. Mm-hmm. The clearance is the big game. You could be less qualified, not kick in as many doors. If you're just doing, if you were, were a marine and you know how to shoot decently and you know how to, you know, hold a rifle and you're in decent, in good shape, you know, not a slob, mm-hmm. you can get a job in a lot of places if you have a clearance over that. 0311 who kicked in a bunch of doors and that's it's amazing to me but that clearance that clearance goes a long way because it shows you're trustworthy one and two you know like i said if you if you if you're competent and such like that 
there are a lot of companies like you show up, you can't hack it. They have, they throw you back on that bus. You show up, you're fat. They throw you back on that bus. You know, you can't qualify with weapons. You go home. Like that still that still happens, and you know because they need they don't want the other contractors, the other military personnel coming on that base and seeing what the hell are you, you know, like what are you, this guy, are you sure he should be here. So that's happening mm-hmm. and such because it is, it is a job and it's a DOD or a DOS job and you need to be, you need to be squared away. You um, know? It's, I'm obviously still doing it. I, uh, I still, you know, I have some other things I, I, I'd like to do both working with the government and whatnot, but I'm obviously still doing it. So it's not that bad. It is what you make of it. You know, if you had a hard time doing X, Y, and Z in the military, you know, I can grow a beard. You know, I got a pretty good gym for free. You know, I can watch YouTube and Netflix. You know, FaceTime's a little hard, but Facebook Messenger works. You know, I've been to some really cool countries, you know, on my on my vacation and downtime. 24 years old, I've done some cool stuff just in the last, you know, couple months being here met some great people for every you know every turd you meet there's four or five guys that are yeah. awesome so that's, that's terrific um so my uh let's uh, before i let you go um what advice would you have for a veteran who might be watching this thinking i want to get into the security business or i want to get into the security contractor business um two things it's and i think this has kind of been my I don't. I think mantra might be the right word, and you hear a lot of entrepreneurs say this all the time: is don't focus on the now, the situations now. Like enjoy your life and such, but you need to look look down the road. You know, plans change all the time, but focus on your on your macro. So I kind of got to take my bumps now. I kind of got to sacrifice some sleep now. Sacrifice time around around from your family. Working in the States is hard, mm-hmm. so being overseas is the American dream. The American machine, whatever, whether we're at war or not, we'll always have jobs overseas, you know. And then where you're at in Kuwait, Arif John was there before uh, OIF-1, I believe. That's true. So, you know, after the first Gulf War. So if you want to go to the contracting, man – Put your time in a couple of years, figure out what you want to do, read a bunch of books, save your money, your tax-free money, and work. If you want to start your own security business in the States, just get used to the word no, get used to writing a lot of emails, get used to networking with whoever you can, and keep on showing up, man. Like, like I'm, I'm very lucky. I'm, I think what makes me like it so much is that when I'm working with my two partners on this, mm-hmm. we all get, a, we we're friends. We all get along well. And, and it's just, it's, you know, we're all putting in the effort as much effort as we can. We're all sacrificing a little bit. And if you don't have any skin in the game, whether it's sacrificing your finances or sacrificing your, uh, your fun time at home, you know, I don't think it'll mean anything to you. So when I know when we start getting our bigger contracts, whether they're stateside or with the government, I know I'm going to feel like, hey, man, we put some effort into this, and thank God. So just it's a hustle, man, and you're going to hate it sometimes, but it'll be worth it if you, if you, you know, it's still real, man. I'm still maybe maybe I'm just young, young and dumb, yeah. but man, yeah, it's the it can, you know the free so, market they want you, you know. So where can somebody go to find out more information about your company? And it, your company's called Bastion. We. Uh, Defense Solutions. Okay, Bastion Defense Solutions. Tell us uh, where can we find some more information on Bastion Defense Solutions. You can. Uh, we'll put the Facebook link in this. We mm-hmm. don't have a, uh, a website yet. We also have Instagram. I can put the Instagram link as well. Those would be our two main sources. Um, if anyone feels free to personally mention, uh, message Rodriguez or myself, um, we can uh, go talk more. Um, you know, emails I can put up. Anything you want to talk to me, I am. I will get back to you within twenty four hours. And that, that yeah. What's an What's a good email address somebody could email you at? Uh, P. Rafino at Bastion Defense Solutions dot com, or you can email my partner C. Stump at Bastion Defense Solutions dot com. He is the CEO of it. Fantastic. All right. Yes, 
Patrick, thanks again for uh, taking time out of your busy schedule. And uh, it, it's great to talk to somebody who's also deployed. Uh, as you know, the, the challenges of trying to be online uh, and trying to run a business, yeah. it, it's a completely different animal, uh, but it's great learning experience for both of us, I think. Yeah. Just to uh, give the audience a little tidbit, how many, I think this is, this is the second time, but we were trying to fight for a minute between both work schedules, yes. internet, you know, and even we had a shortage right now, but you know, it, once again, hard work, you know, if you can dream it, you can do it. And bam, That's right. on the AR podcast, <laughs> so I, did so, I did something right. You know, like, We did it, man. Yeah. <laughs> All right, Patrick. Thanks again for everything, man. I'll be in touch with you soon. Take it easy, yes, bro. Sir, I appreciate be it. safe. Later, guys. All right. And that would be it. That's it, man. Awesome. Awesome. Uh, yeah, you I had a blast. Hey, I had a blast too, man. A great interview. Um, so we're looking at about two weeks from now. This will get released uh, simply because I got okay. other stuff in the shoot. And yeah, uh, obviously, yeah. when this comes out, I will email you that week so you can shoot me whatever links you have, whatever uh, updates you have. If you got an event coming up, you could put that out then. But uh, yeah, I'll let yeah. you know when this pops out. Um. Uh, I, I wish you know, I wish I could help more, uh, help you out more, man. Um, if you have any, if anyone that hits you up about this, looking for work, man. Like I said, we're we're pretty small right now, but we got a lot of lines in the uh, lines in the lines in the. Um, I'm sorry, I'm losing lines in the lake. You know, as it's far as opportunities. So once you get those bites, man. If you have anyone veteran, you know that's like, hey, man. Like we're trying to get some overseas stuff right yeah. now. You know, well, every, we'll obviously. Do, yeah, I'm I'm hoping that that you get some more I ho i'm hoping you get some feedback i really do I, i'd love to hear yeah. if uh anybody gets with you about your company or any number of things man i'm always hoping yeah. for business to business as well so yeah definitely man like i like i said put in a little bit of put a decent amount of skin in this and uh i guess you know i think it's my only my big thing is i put all my skin in it which is kind of you know I, and like i said be man, safe people, man you gotta be yeah, safe gotta be, yeah and i I hate it, but it's a smart thing to do all at the same time. So. It is. Absolutely. All right, Patrick. I will talk to you later, brother. You have a good day. Yes, sir. Thank you so much. Later. Later. All right. That was Patrick Rufino, uh, Bastion Defense Solutions, LLC. Guys, do not hesitate to drop them an email. Ask them about the opportunities that they are presenting for overseas contracting. And before you take – before you sign – any offer letters, before you uh, sign any letters of commitment, do your homework, okay? The world of contracting is, is it, it, it can be very intricate, okay? Um, there are a lot of companies out there, and every company has their pros and their cons. So don't just talk to the companies, but find people that are out there right now and reach out to other contractors in the field that you're looking to get into and find out what it is that those companies are looking for, how you can better market yourself, and if there are other things that you need to have before you apply that will make you more marketable or make you more likely to be hired. Everything from if there's a couple of college courses you need to knock out before you get your associates or um, if you need to be up to date on a certain skill set or qualif licensure, qualifications, things like that. Don't just jump into this thinking, well, I got four years in the Marine Corps. I got four years in the Army. I'll be good. They, they'll be stupid not to hire me. I'm telling you, it is not as easy as you may think. Um, and then, uh, you know, the world of contracting is completely dependent on government money, on contracts, where you're at in the contract, if you're at the beginning, at the tail end, uh, renegotiations. A lot of stuff can go right and a lot of stuff can go wrong. So before you make any commitment, guys, do your homework. And one final thing on the world of contracting. The pay is good. The pay can be good. But there's a lot to know about this tax-free thing. So make sure that if you do commit and you're like, I'm going to do this contracting thing. I'm going to go overseas. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. Great things, high-speed stuff. Make sure you know all about what the tax-free piece of that uh, of deployments are, what that entails, and exactly how that works. Because if you don't, you could wind up in a in a worse finance, financial situation uh, coming out of country than you were when you got there. So, like I said, 
Make sure you do your homework. Make sure you drop Patrick Buffino at Bastion uh, Defense Solutions LLC. Make sure you drop them a line. Links are below. Make, Make sure you like, listen, subscribe, and share the After Action Review podcast with all of your friends and your colleagues and people that you like. Hell, even people you don't like. Let them know that we're out here and that we are working hard to bring you guys uh, these amazing veteran entrepreneurs like Patrick Rafino. We are 26 episodes deep. Hey, that's 25 other episodes. Uh, once you're done with this one, go check out the other ones. They're, they're all really great and really proud of all these veterans. And they're out there and they're on the show giving you as much information uh, as they can possibly give to you. So that way you can learn from their mistakes as well as their successes. So that does it for me. I'm out. Uh, I will see you at episode 27. <laughs>